to the Apocalyptic Gospel Podcast, where we explore the gospel that Jesus' earliest disciples heard and what the last several decades of historical studies have clarified about this first century Jewish message. Welcome to the Apocalyptic Gospel Podcast. I'm Josh Hawkins, and I'm here with Bill Schofield and with John Harrigan. Hey guys, how's it going? What's up? Good. Hey, awesome. Great to be with you guys again today. Listeners, this is our third episode of season three of our show here. And as we've been talking about, our goal in this season is to develop an appreciation and understanding of the Tanakh, the Old Testament. It, and and really, just to help set it up, we, we've been saying we don't want the Tanakh just to serve as some sort of opening act for Jesus and what he did on the cross. We really want to develop the themes in terms of a historical progression and and how it's led to specific ways that we understand Jesus. And so this is our goal here in season three. Yeah. So in the first episode, we uh, just did kind of a survey of the Tanakh and and talked about the the main themes of you know creation, the covenant, Jewish election, eschatology, and then and ultimately messianism that de, that developed out of the Tanakh and and became the key components to kind of the Jewish apocalyptic worldview that was that is assumed in the New Testament. Yeah, and uh, like Josh was saying. Um, the real goal is to develop an appreciation that transcends, you know, the Tanakh simply being some sort of an opening act for Jesus. And uh, we talked last week about what I think is a great kind of way to portray how how Christian tradition has developed along those lines when we talked about our Kindle Solon and his, con- his uh, concept of structural supersessionism where we frame our preaching of the Bible and our reading of the Bible as though the Tanakh really only has the, you know, the introduction to Jesus to offer us. And the rest is kind of relegated to irrelevant antiquity. So, and that leads us to today. Yeah. Today's episode we are really excited about because in this third episode of this season, We want to talk specifically about anti-Judaism, both in modern theology and in the history of the church. So we've talked about supersessionism and the themes that the Tanakh develops, but how has this bias, how has this way of viewing the Bible, how has this affected our readings of Jesus and Paul and how then we should live in light of that? But we have a very special guest that we want to bring on for our episode today. It's Dr. Matthew Thiessen. Matthew Thiessen is an associate professor of religious studies at McMaster University. He's a Canadian scholar, and he's the author of three books, Contesting Conversion, Paul and the Gentile Problem, and his most recent book, Jesus and the Forces of Death. Matt, welcome to the show, man. Thanks for having me. Great to have you. Well, why don't you, uh, let's just start right here at the beginning, and why don't you share a little bit about yourself and how you got into New Testament studies in general? Because, uh, you know, as we mentioned, some of our listeners may be familiar with some of your books, especially your most recent book, um, Jesus and the Forces of Death, and, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Phenomenal work, by the way, and and I don't think that we can commend that book enough just in, in terms of the way it makes, especially the work of Jacob Milgram and, and its application to Jesus and, and specifically things like lepra. We'll, we'll get into some of this a little bit, but, um, yeah, just, uh, why don't you just start by telling us a little bit about yourself? Yeah. So, uh, you know, yeah, you asked about, uh, what got me into religious studies and biblical studies and, uh, it all goes back to my first year of university when I was studying science in, uh, the hopes of getting rich. Um, and, the, uh, the only course I enjoyed taking was actually a philosophy course that I had accidentally signed up for. Uh, and it was the only class I attended, in fact, for most of one academic year. And so I quickly realized that uh, as much as I wanted to be rich, science uh, was not the way I was going to be able to do that uh, since I just could not study it anymore. And up to that point, I had always really enjoyed it. So I sort of took a year off and regrouped and, and uh, entered into a religious studies program thinking I could do theology, philosophy, uh, you know, ancient history and all that stuff. And it was really uh, biblical studies in that period, learning Greek and, and working on on uh, biblical texts that got me uh, really animated about uh, sort of my future. And so that's that's how it all began. Uh, and that's why I'm, I'm here today. Yeah. So what was it specifically that led you into Christian anti-Judaism? Yeah. It was... Uh, 
I mean, it's always something that's been on my mind, I guess, not always, but for most of my life. But my, my first year after, after taking a year off, my first year in religious studies, I took a course on Paul. Um, and, you know, I had sort of grown up with a traditional reading of Paul, which, which scholars often call the Lutheran reading of Paul. Um, and I had this professor teaching a very different approach to Paul. And I thought, wow, I didn't even know you could read Paul differently. And, and seeing the way this professor went about looking at Paul uh, within the context of, of early Judaism, uh, it really sort of flicked the switch for me that, that uh, maybe the way we read these ancient texts isn't the right way. And maybe the way we're reading them uh, is not fair to ancient Jews and ultimately to, to contemporary Jews as well. So really that course that did it uh, and, and sort of every course since then has, you know, added a component to that. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. Yeah, it is great. I, <clears throat> I, I was looking earlier um, or I guess last night to see how many of your books I had worked through. And really, a lot of them are aimed at that subject, right? All the way back from contesting conversion. I remember going through that one, found so many of those ideas helpful. And hmm. some of the stuff with uh, the interlocutor in Romans went through that season as well. That was really helpful. <clears throat> oh, by the way, you've, you've arrived a little bit because now when I Google your name, the guy from Reliant K is like three or four down. So well done. <laughs> yeah. On your Google searches, maybe, but uh, uh, true. Yeah, uh, but I'll true. take. It. I'll okay. take. Okay, um, great, true. Yeah. Um, so, so tell me. Uh, so I can definitely see a thread, like 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 Josh said, from contesting conversion all the way through Jesus and the forces of death. But how how have you seen your work and tried to aim it at the issue of like anti Judaism in Christian readings? Yeah. Uh, again, it sort of goes back to that original course on Paul. I knew this Lutheran, quote unquote, Lutheran take. And this professor I had really, really sort of pushed the what's called the new perspective, the sort of Tom Wright, James Dunn approach. Sure. Right. And I didn't find either of them satisfying readings of the evidence. Right. And I also very quickly felt like, well, I don't think the uh, new perspective is any less ultimately anti-Jewish right, right. <laughs> than the Lutheran perspective and probably given sort of modern, uh, you know, sim- sympathies, maybe even more so, um, more pointed. So uh, I knew there was a question around, especially Paul and the law that I wanted to get at, but that's such a massive topic and so many people have written on it. Uh, and it was, it was um, reading through the book of Jubilees that I sort of stumbled across and thought about, well, the right of circumcision seems really important here. And so that's really what got me going and just thinking about actual flesh and blood bodies and law and concepts of identity. And uh, that's sort of the thread that's, that ties everything together around the topic of anti-Judaism. And, you know, it's not, um, it's not uncommon to hear very sort of negative comments made about circumcision no kidding. Yeah. Uh, and other bodily practices of, of ancient Jews. Um and how Paul sort of transcends that because he cares about, and Jesus too, because he cares about the interior, not the external. And um, I mean, it all it all feeds into this larger narrative of Christianity as a relationship, not a religion, uh, which I think, I mean, I think it's wrong. Yeah, um, right. <laughs> so many levels. And uh, the this sort of disembodied notion of what Christianity is, and the idea that just because you're concerned about body parts. And what bodies do means you're not concerned about the internal seem deeply unfair to um, ancient Jews and, and any other religious tradition, frankly. Uh, so that's sort of, I think, how I've gotten into the question of anti-Judaism in, in scholarship and in, in broader Christian thinking and, and sort of attacked the foundations of it by re-examining Paul and Jesus around bodily practices yeah, so so Matt in Jesus and the Forces of Death, you make a statement that much of Christian theological tradition could be termed as somewhat neo Marcionite. Um, could you just kind of give the our listeners a, a little survey of anti Jewish theology, kind of from its uh, origins in the early church through today? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm not an expert in any of these areas, so so I'll just give some sort of brief comments here that that hopefully are helpful. 
you know, I think the earliest Christians. So when I say Christian, I don't mean Paul and his generation, but I mean, you know, sort of second century moving forwards. Uh, they've inherited these texts from Paul and the Gospels. And, uh, you know, they value them deeply. They're by and large at this point becoming a Gentile movement, a non-Jewish movement. And they're trying to wrestle with the fact that they have these texts along with Jewish scriptures, which they deem authoritative and valuable. And they're trying to address non-Gentiles who maybe are still attracted to, to Jewish practices. And so, you know, all of the stuff they write has this rhetorical charge to it. They can't get rid of the Old Testament because they're not Marcionite uh, explicitly, and they're rejecting Marcion, but they have to come up with sort of strategies for saying, okay, these texts are there about circumcision and ritual purity and the temple and everything else. How do we sort of neutralize them uh, to support us without, but without giving Marcion, you know, the game? Um, and I, I think one way they do it, and they're not even aware that they're doing it, is they take for instance, Paul's letters, which are written uh, predominantly, maybe exclusively to Gentile audiences and just sort of broadly universalizing them, which of course is what happens when you treat them as scripture, you're going to do that. But how do you do that? Well, is the question. And so what on the surface and Paul's rhetoric uh, in his letters or what originally in his letters refers to a Gentile interested in adopting Jewish practices and maybe becoming a Jew all of a sudden becomes just a blanket indictment of Judaism, the Jewish law, circumcision for everybody. And you mix that in with the very, uh, you know, complicated, awkward reality that you have this little movement that's relatively new, following Jesus, claiming Jewish scriptures, the Jewish Messiah, the Jewish God, and everything else that's, that's very Jewish. And yet you have these other Jews over here who claim many of the same things, they just don't recognize your Messiah as the Messiah. And so there's also sort of animosity and conflict building up between Jews and now Christians around who's got the right reading of scripture, who's following the law the right way. And so you sort of have these, I think, two prongs that start to feed into anti-Judaism. And I mean, you see it already as early as Justin Martyr, uh, and it morphs over the, over the centuries. And of course, in, in, you know, for instance, the Reformation, you get not concern about people being attracted to Judaism. That's not your concern. Nobody's nobody who's not Jewish is really that attracted to Judaism. But you have, uh, you know, the, the reformers trying to find scriptural evidence against what they see as the abuses of, of Roman Catholicism. And so you get this tight uh equation between Roman Catholicism and Jesus's opponents or Paul's opponents, the Pharisees or the Jews um, in, in Luther's thinking. And so that anti-Judaism gets used against one's religious opponents. And we, of course, we see it over and over again to this day, right? Uh, how many times on social media in a week do you see a Christian post something about what a Pharisaic position, yep. a person's a total Pharisee, yeah. Um, as though Pharisee is obviously and innately something negative. Right. Um, it's not. I can see why uh, someone reading through Mark or Matthew might come to that conclusion uh, without realizing that this is inner Jewish debate. Um, and of course, it ignores what Luke does. Luke has very good Pharisees at times. And so does so does John, for that matter. So, you know, I think the, the history of anti-Judaism, it just keeps keeps going and it has uh, religious and non-religious roots, but there are scriptural passages which seem to continue to fuel that fire because of how they've been sort of misappropriated. Matt, that's good. I, I remember kind of like you mentioned that that season in your first year back from college, uh, first year back in college, and going maybe this traditional reading or like you call Lutheran reading of Paul is not right. <laughs> maybe there's something not right about it. And so I remember, I remember when I had, when I had a similar uh, moment later in life than you, and uh, and I remember going, man, where can I, where can I? I started reading people who I thought were reputable on the subject, and I remember having a season where I don't know how many times a year I would go over Stendhal's Introspective Conscience over and over again, just to kind of get some of the ideas out of my head. But 
So how do you think, how do you think, like, but you're right, it is that, and or Stendhal's right, that it, what, what was happening with Luther is he was making his opponents into the Pharisees in a way to justify his opposition biblically to his contemporaries. So, so how do you think, again, recognizing this isn't your field, but you're, but you're observant, you, you work in the field, you, um, and you, like, you know, obviously, you know, knowing things that are going on, like Andy Stanley's comment and things like that, you're, you're somewhat aware of what's going on in the world now. Um, how do you think some of these things have developed in modern discourse since the Holocaust and World War II? Mm. Do you have any, I know it's not your area of expertise, but I'd just love to hear your observations yeah. since you've interacted so much with that world in academia. Yeah. So I, I, I do think uh, we've seen a growing, it's not perfect by any means and it's not everywhere, but we've seen, we've seen a growing awareness that there's, that Christians shouldn't, you know, sort of condemn as a, as a monolith Judaism in Jews as right you know, X, Y, or, or Z, or Z, depending on where you live. Um, <laughs> so that, that's, a, that's a step forward, I think. A real step forward that I think a lot of places have seen. Um, but I, So this is where I think the Pharisees, they act as a cipher for all Jews. Uh, and there are a couple of reasons for that. Uh, you know, traditionally, Pharisees are understood as as the predecessors of the rabbis, and of course, rabbinic Judaism uh, is is by and large the sort of uh, the font of modern Judaism in a lot of ways. So these equations happen, but they're implicit, uh, and so you know, n- numerous, especially Jewish scholars, have pointed out when you use the word Pharisee negatively, you're really you're really, whether you know it or not, or even mean it or not, you're really caricaturing all of Judaism. And so I think that that just, that just continues. And, uh, you know, I think, I think the new perspective is a great example. I, I think Jimmy Dunn and Tom Wright had, had nothing but the best of intentions, for instance, back in the eighties uh, or late seventies for Tom's dissertation, when they saw Ed Sanders's work, and said, wow, this is clear evidence that Jews seem to have, you know, by and large, if not universally believed that God was gracious and that God's grace was prior to any human behavior. Uh, they said, that's great. Uh, that's good. And in, with post-Holocaust sensibilities said that we don't have to accuse them of this awful religion anymore, but what's Paul's problem with them? Yeah. And so that sort of same structure exists yeah. <laughs> and they go and they attack what they're seeing in the 80s as a real problem, racism, ethnocentricity, British colonialism and imperialism, and they're seeing this as a real sin, rightly. They're seeing this as an evil. But then they're trying to get that back into the Bible to have sort of a scriptural precedent for why they're condemning it. And I think you can condemn it without having to have that as a scriptural precedent. But, right. <laughs> um, and why do you have to... I, this is, I think this is the problem. Why do we have to have foils uh, for Jesus or for Paul? Um, that seems to me to actually mean that Jesus and Paul aren't that attractive on their own. You have to have some bad guy in the background to make them the good guys. Um, and I think that's really problematic for, for any sort of religious uh, tradition. And of course, if you're, if you're caricaturing or, or, um, misrepresenting Paul's opponents or Jesus's opponents, uh, even even more so. And there's a real moral problem there. But what does it really say about your religious tradition if the way to make it attractive is to lie about your opponents? Uh, we just had an election here in Canada. And of course, politicians say all kinds of things. And I have a fair amount of cynicism towards them. But if your whole platform is, that guy's very bad, uh, that's not a platform. You haven't said anything positive about yourself. You may be, you may be exactly right. That person may be awful. That party may be really, really awful in what it, what it presents. But you need to have your own campaign about what you're going to do for the good of society. And so all of that is to say, I think, you know, post-Holocaust, we're, we're more sensitive. But I think we all have our, our um, areas where we're not seeing the way we're sort of reinscribing Christian anti-Judaism. And 
And I say that, and I wonder in my own work, uh, are there places where I'm doing something similar and completely oblivious to it? Um, and even against, you know, what I, what I hope are good intentions somewhere in there, there's something problematic that someone could latch onto and really misuse. Yeah. Yeah. I actually have a, uh, I actually have a Jewish friend who, who listens to the podcast and I get feedback about <laughs> comments that I make sometimes and I go, oh, no. I, I never thought about that that way. Okay. It's good. To, it's good to remember. Um, no, that's good. That's good, Matt. It, you know, that's, that's, it's a great point. I've heard similar points, but the way you framed it, I, I'd never thought it's true, ironically. Ultimately, some of the new perspective ended up doing the same thing Luther did. Yeah. And I, I'd never actually thought of it in those terms. That's exactly right. I, I will say, so, you know, James Dunn, when he wrote his, his the new perspective on Paul, there was sort of an edited volume of essays. Yeah. Uh, it was heavily critiqued by, by a number of people especially for, he, he compares Jewish, ancient Jewish ethnocentricity to apartheid segregation, all these awful modern evils. Um, and he was critiqued for that. Well, he actually doubled down on it in his revised edition. I will say Tom Wright, where he used to talk about race, not grace right. for Paul. Right, right. grace, <laughs> yeah, the wrong grace way. not race. Uh, grace, not race. Judaism preaches grace. Paul yeah. preaches grace. You know, in his in his massive uh, seventeen hundred page Paul book that came out well almost a decade now um, ago, I feel like he's really backed off of that angle. Yeah, it doesn't come out clearly, at least. And so, you know, if, if he's moved away, we realize that's problematic. Problematic. That's that's a, a great sign. I yeah, think that's good. Yeah, that's a good point. Very much so. Yeah. yeah. Talk to talk to our listeners a little bit about some of the intra Jewish. Uh, polemic that's happening with Jesus specifically, because I think that's where a lot of the caricaturing happens is that you have this really intense conflicts that happen with Jesus and people just kind of uh, create characters. They, cr they project Jesus against Judaism in general, rather than specific dynamics happening uh, in first century yeah. Judaism. So what are your thoughts on on that? Yeah, ancient ancient polemics are uh, you know they're pretty animated. Uh, we we see this. I, I don't think modern polemics are any different, especially in the last well five six years. Right. Uh, in, in the North American context. <laughs> <Right>. um, <laughs> now, mind you, uh, our polemics can be heated and have real substance and real consequences, uh, and they probably did in antiquity as well. But these were these were Jews debating how best to live out the Jewish law in fidelity to God's covenant that God had graciously made with Israel. And that's a heavy, big, important subject. Of course, emotions might run high at times. Uh, polemics might get a little heated, uh, but it wasn't a disagreement on the fundamentals. It was because they agreed on the fundamentals that they're having these arguments, these heated arguments, I think. And so, you know, that's part of what you're seeing. I will also say, this is something I've actually wanted to, to research and write an, an article on. I do sometimes wonder if our translations make these interactions more heated than they actually are. Uh, whenever we have, uh, you know, these debate, these discussions between Jesus and the Pharisees, is it is it uh, questions in good faith? Yeah. Is it uh, trying to trick Jesus? Uh, is it just discussion and debate, not disagreement and argument and condemnation? And I think while there's some of that for sure, I think going through and carefully looking at, you know, translational options here, are we amplifying the conflict that maybe was there and not, you know, accurately describing it? And there, yeah, there are cultural differences. It's right. And there's also, you know, the people that I argue with probably most heatedly are my own family members. Uh, hmm. It's not the stranger on the street. It's not my, my, my enemies, uh, many as they are. It's, you know, my dad and I disagree with about lots of different things and that can get heated sometimes. And that's not, doesn't mean we're without fault, but it's, uh, I think we end up because we care so much about people and we're in relationship. We know those relationships are going to last. 
you end up perhaps saying more than you should, or maybe saying it in ways you shouldn't. And so I think, again, Jesus is arguing, this is what scholars have, have suggested for ages. Jesus is closest in many ways to the Pharisees uh, than he is to any other group uh, that, that, well, that we know of existing in the first century. Right. Yeah. Uh, you know, you look at the argumentation in the gospels and so many times it, it looks just like the way the rabbis um, argue in later rabbinic literature and presumably the Pharisees argued in the first century. Um, they share so much in common and where they disagree, they disagree uh, harshly, but it's because they can do it because they're in such close agreement on other things. Right. You know, I remember right. John Levinson said one time that the, uh, the most Jewish thing that second century Christianity did was, uh, was supersessionism. <laughs> he goes, it's such a Jewish thing to do. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so Matt, uh, I remember, uh, the first time I came across your new, your newest kind of, uh, work on Jesus and the purity system was from a video someone posted from YouTube of a, it's like a little bit, it's like a round table where you're just reading a paper on, uh, on Jesus and Lepra. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. And I about fell out of my chair cause I'd never heard anybody take some of, uh, uh, Milgram's talks and I know he references it briefly but and really try to play that out across the gospels. Yeah. And I thought, man, and then I remember I emailed you and you're like, I'm actually working on a book. I was like, sweet. Okay. So wow. I'd love to hear. So just so tell us a little bit about the book and how you think the kind of anti-Jewish bias, anti-Judaism bias has played into our overall reading of, of Jesus in a little more detail. Yeah. I, I will know. Uh you know, some things I do in the book are novel and some are not. Uh, there are others, Thomas Kazin and Cecilia uh, Wasson, oh, both yeah. in, in Sweden now, have done some work on this and quite, actually extensive work on this, I should mm. say. So I'll note that for, for you and for uh, listeners. I'll, yeah, um, I'll check it out. You know, I think so much of this, again, is uh, well, one of the things is we all I, I've never wore these. I was too old for this. And and. Uh, out, out of this world at the time, but when when those little bracelets came out, the WWJD bracelets, <laughs> uh, yeah, you know that gets mocked on some levels. But that's actually a question that Christians have asked for two thousand years, roughly. What would Jesus do? Right. With the implication of, well, what should I then do? And you know, there's a simplicity to that that I think is problematic, but there's something about that that I think makes sense for, for Christianity. If Jesus is doing things that you don't do, you might feel like, oh, shoot, I should be doing them or or something. And so Christians for virtually 2,000 years have, have not practiced, for instance, ritual purity laws. Right. So if you see Jesus in the Gospels interacting with the ritually impure people, you sort of, you're at least... You have a predilection, at least, to look and say, okay, so clearly Jesus doesn't approve of the ritual purity laws. So what is this story doing? You know, so I think it's not it's not anti-Jewish in the sense of any sort of like explicit anti-Judaism. It's we don't do these things. So obviously Jesus didn't do these things. So these stories have some meaning that shows he's abandoning the law. Right. And. You know, I think that you see that over and over again, reading through these stories and, you know, the, the case of the man with lepra, it's, it's Jesus's second deed of power, or what we call a miracle in the gospel of Mark, uh, where we have a man with this condition often referred to as leprosy in English. And it's not um, just minor, minor skin conditions of various sorts. The man comes and says to Jesus, if you desire, if you want, you can make me clean, pure. And Jesus says, I desire, be pure. Uh, which he heals the man of his lepra. I don't know how that, uh, you know, shows Jesus abandoning concern about ritual purity. That would be, I think, akin to saying, well, this person doesn't believe in COVID. How do I know this? It's because he went and got the vaccination. Right. Uh, you don't treat a condition that you don't believe exists or don't Good believe point. is significant. Well said. So this is what Jesus is doing in, in the Gospels with 
<clears throat> sorry, all three uh, sorts of ritual impurities. He's treating the underlying condition. And in fact, even in Mark 1, the story of, of the man with lepra, at the end, Jesus commands him to actually obey the law, Leviticus 13 and 14, well, 14 really, um, to go to the priest, show himself, and then perform the offerings that are required. And so, you know, it's, it's, uh, and for years I read it, I read it the sort of traditional way as Jesus abandoning the law. And, and, you know, now I look at it and say, I don't know how that's even possible to read it that way, but uh, we get trained in these readings and then those sort of, it's like, you know, water running down a hill at some point, it, it creates a little uh, track, a little um, divot or a valley. And then the water naturally runs there without even trying to. And that's what I think happens in our interpretations of the Bible. Um, it's easiest to read it that way, which makes it feel like it's natural and therefore the correct reading, but that's not always the case. Yeah. I remember, like I said, that, that first video where you were reading that paper and then later on as I uh, picked up the book, just it, it's remarkable how it's actually just the opposite what's trying to be communicated. It's actually... Yeah. Because what's at stake for the guy with lepra isn't a life of, you know, of living limbless and in pain and destitution. It's exclusion from the temple. And Jesus' yeah. concern is that he would be able to approach the sanctuary. Yeah. It's like that is, that is such a remarkable, I mean, you couldn't get, it's literally the opposite reading. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's, those are great points. So are there any particular other things that maybe we would find because of this anti-Jewish bias, uh, anti-Judaism um, perspective that has been raised in the Gospels that may have something similar, like a completely opposite reading uh, of of that, like with Leviticus 14 and, yeah. and Jesus cleansing him and saying, go to the priest? Yep. Yeah, you know, there's the... <laughs> Could sort of talk all day on this. I think if, if I wanted to, uh, if you'd let me, I should say I do want to. Um, <laughs> I think you could think about a, a variety of different things. I'll give you a really brief one to start. Um, this, the quote unquote temple cleansing that looks like and has often been interpreted as a condemnation of the temple, the temple cult, the priests, etc. But at least as the narratives lie, I guess we can always ask what the historical Jesus actually did and said and what it actually meant, but that's hard to determine. Uh, I would actually say impossible to determine. Uh, the whole point is Jesus is very upset about how the temple's getting used. And you're only upset about how something's getting used if you care about that thing, right? Uh, I don't really care what my neighbor does with their yard. If they want their dogs to poop in their yard, uh, sorry, I'm giving a crass example here. I guess go for it, although I really enjoy that. Never mind. It does bother me. Um, but if their dog uses my lawn for a bathroom and then it's there when I wake up the next day, I get very upset about that. Uh, so, and if I have to see it on anybody else's yard, you know what I mean? I'm giving you a, a long analogy yeah. to explain everything you already know. So it's um, the whole point is he only... He only protests what's happening there because he cares because it's holy. It's a house of prayer and it's being misused, not a condemnation of the temple. Now, it might be that the temple has been so badly misused that it's currently not functioning. It's not efficacious. Right. And so maybe it has to be cleaned or maybe it has to be abandoned for a while or for a time or who knows. Um, so that's one example. I think the, the other one, and this is a larger one, there are Sabbath controversies. Uh, there are all these stories. The, the majority of the stories about Jesus and law are really about the Sabbath. And uh, over and over again, there are accusations about Jesus not keeping the Sabbath properly. Well, all but one of those instances, what is he doing on the Sabbath? He's not cooking hamburgers and selling hamburgers at a hamburger stand. Uh, you know, he's not working. He's not earning a living. He's healing. He's not doing, he's not mowing the grass. He's healing people. And so the question is, is this a form of work? Is this a form of work that's legitimate or illegitimate on the Sabbath? Not the Sabbath is irrelevant. It actually seems, at least the way the gospel writers portray it, that Jesus thinks Sabbath is a particularly great time to heal people. Uh, why? Because the Sabbath is a day of joy. 
It's uh, a day for life. And so restoring life and joy to people is integral to the Sabbath. Now that's suggesting that what Jesus is doing is takes precedence over Sabbath rest. And that's a controversial claim. Uh, But in later rabbinic uh, tradition, and this is maybe something listeners don't know so well, the uh, the sort of paradigm for how to read the law over and over again, rabbis talk about this, maybe it wasn't universally held, but was the preservation of life, uh, what's referred to as pikuach nefesh. And, and to this day, Jews will point to that principle for how to interpret the law properly. So in rabbinic tradition, if a house falls down because of an earthquake, on the Sabbath, you start digging right away. It doesn't matter if it's work. You get down to work to save life because that person's life trumps Sabbath rest. And this is exactly what Jesus is doing in the Gospels and what he says he's doing. That Sabbath is created for humanity, not humanity for the Sabbath. And so... What we look at and say, oh, man, that's so, um, whatever word we want to use, progressive, liberal, um, such a such a, 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 a abandonment of Judaism is actually just what later rabbis would agree with. Of course, the question is, is Jesus actually doing this uh, in, in these gospel narratives? And what does it say about who he is? And so the question of his identity, I think, is really what where the root of these, these questions should be. Yeah, I think that's a great point as far as just kind of, you know, the, those specific Jewish things that are flashpoints in the Gospels, that the way those polemic interactions unfold, uh, it's like the anti-Jewish bias ends up slanting the approach to those interactions against Judaism in general. And therefore pits Jesus against kind of the the worldview that that particularly the Pharisees, but Jews in general are holding at the time. And when it when in actuality it's exactly the opposite, that you know, he cleanses the temple because he has zeal for the temple. He heals on the Sabbath because of his you know, his esteem for the Sabbath. Uh, or, you know, Jesus picking 12 disciples as somehow, you know, spiritually fulfilling or superseding uh, Jewish expectations at the time, when in reality, uh, it's an amplification of that. The, the disciples really expected, you know, a, a restoration of the 12 tribes along those lines. Um, so I think a lot of those same dynamics happen with Paul because Paul has, you know, intra-Jewish polemical interactions. Um, so what are your thoughts, Matt, on, you know, how kind of our slant against Judaism that we inherit from, you know, Christian theological tradition, how that affects our reading of Paul, uh, some of the novelties in Paul that we don't see in Judaism at the time, and how, you know, we read uh, Paul, Paul's emphasis on the gift of the Spirit, the mission to the Gentiles, the death of the Messiah, how that uh, those traditions kind of influence our interpretation of Paul. Yeah. Uh, you know, <laughs> Paul's letters are deeply polemical, right? So they're, uh, they're, they lend themselves uh, to function as scriptural ammunition in one's contemporary debates in arguments with others. Uh, I don't think Paul was trying to cast his opponents or competitors or whatever word you want to use here in, in you know, the best possible light. That wasn't his point. He was trying to get his readers to do what he, he believed was required of them, really, by the gospel. So uh, I think you already have these letters, which are really, you know, they're very specific and precise to particular groups of people in a particular place and time. And as soon as we, you know, use them to talk about something else, we're already skating out onto thin ice. I'm not saying it shouldn't be done or can't be done or the Christian should throw Paul's letters out or anything like that. I'm just saying we need to be, we need to take care. And, and uh, uh, you know, Richard Hayes talks about the word leaping the gap and how does one how does the word leap the gap well, uh, and how do we know it, it has? So I think that's already that's already an issue with Paul's letters. 
Um, the problem is we come to Paul's letters and think, Paul, Christian. Paul, church. Even our translation of a very generic word, ecclesia, as church, is, is absurd. Because we all think of church as, well, a building with a steeple and a cross on top of it. Not that that's that common in modern architecture of churches anymore. But still, that's what we think. And we think of a building filled with Christians when ecclesia just means a gathering um, or an assembly. Uh, I haven't come up with a great translation of it other than other than that, which others have suggested. And so you've already thought of, you know, Christian church, something distinct from Judaism and synagogue. And once you have that sort of scaffolding in place, when you read Paul's letters, it's almost impossible not to read them as Paul abandoning Judaism, condemning Judaism, condemning the Jewish law, condemning circumcision, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so I think it's it's such an easy reading. And again, we inherit it uh, if we grow up in the church uh, or, we, you know, when we're in the church, we hear it and there it is. And it just becomes the natural way to read. So I think, again, one of the keys, uh, I'm, I'm trying to write a popular level book on Paul right now that sort of distills some of the stuff I've, I've previously written on Paul. Um, and I'm one of the most important things to me is trying to avoid translating terms in, you know, what, what maybe would be considered Christianese. So I don't use Christ. I don't use Christian. I don't use church, even apostle. Awesome. I mean, apostle is just a transliteration, but it's a Christian. Yep. As soon as you hear apostle, you think nothing but Christian. And so how do I, how do we peel back the layers of even something as simple as translation to get to a reading of Paul that is constantly reminding us that he's a first century Jew living in the larger Greco-Roman world and that ancient Jews didn't all agree on everything. Uh, and so just because Paul might disagree with other Jews or many other Jews on a topic doesn't mean he's abandoning, abandoned Judaism. So uh, I think that's a large part of it, but um, you know, especially questions around the law, they don't come up in every letter. Uh, and this is something I think we've inherited from Luther to see it's always law versus gospel works versus faith. Well, that doesn't appear in all of Paul's letters. And he talks about good works very positively uh, at times. So it all depends on remembering that this, this contrast is uh, not everywhere. And where it's somewhere, it's always, it seems to be always in a context of the question of whether Gentile believers in Jesus should pick up the law. And that's when Paul gets at his most polemical. Uh, and his whole point is that Gentiles absolutely can't uh, keep the law. They're all the aspects of the law. He's not, you know, completely law free, as Paula Fredrickson has shown nicely. There are lots of things that Gentiles have to adopt. They've entered into a fundamentally Jewish movement. They just aren't supposed to do the, the things that are distinctive to Jews uh, in terms of like circumcision, Sabbath, et cetera, food. Um, we have to constantly keep that in mind, not extrapolate a negative comment about circumcision to mean Paul thinks all circumcision, for instance, is mutilation, which he says in Philippians 3. Um, that's hard to do. And it's hard to convince readers of that. Yeah, I just did a, a survey here on uh, the book of Galatians, and, and I came out of that just – Galatians is a – is a strange book like Galatians is a unique, awkward situation. I think from Paul's perspective, that is not the norm in my mind, like first and second Thessalonians would be the norm for Paul relating to Gentiles, but you have a, yeah. a very unique and uh, more strange situation happening in in the Galatian churches that is not happening elsewhere. But when you get kind of a Paul versus Judaism approach, then, you know, the book of Galatians becomes central to justifying that approach. Whereas no. if you have Paul within Judaism discipling the Gentiles into the Jewish apocalyptic hope, then first and second Thessalonians would be much more normal as far as kind of how Paul would relate to Gentiles yeah. in general, you know? 
I think it's great to remember, and this is something that modern scholars have really pushed back on in a Lutheran view, is, is when you look at Paul's letters, you're not seeing law versus gospel, faith versus works, justification by faith everywhere. It's in a couple of letters, and it's not unimportant to Paul, but it's not actually central. It seems to be, in some ways, a reaction to controversies that have arisen after right. Paul uh, started his mission, not before. When he first started preaching, there's nothing about circumcision in Thessalonians, right? right? There's nothing about law observance in, in First Thessalonians. That's not the concern. Um, so it's really important to look at, well, what is, you know, I don't know that we can ever find a center for Paul. I have some concerns about that kind of thinking. But I do, th- I do think that Albert Schweitzer over 100 years ago was right. It's participation in Christ, this in being in the Messiah um, is central to Paul's theology, and only when this controversy arises about, well, maybe Gentiles need to become Jews, does Paul say, wait a minute, why would they need to become Jews? They're already in the Messiah. And if you're saying they need to become Jews, you're saying that being in the Messiah isn't sufficient. And as soon as you say being in the, in the Messiah isn't sufficient, I am going nuts, <laughs> Paul says. Uh, that's deeply concerning. And so I think this is, I think there's there are real structural differences, I think, between, in Paul's mind, between Jewish law observance Jewish believers observing the law and Gentile believers observing the law because Gentile believers come to Jesus and then they're adding the law suggests Jesus ain't enough. Whereas Jewish believers, they already have the law. This is just part of their heritage. Uh, They have received it from their parents and are bequeathing it to their children. And they're adding the Messiah to that. This belief that Jesus is the Messiah to that suggesting again, the Messiah is what is, you know, that's fundamental. Jewish law observance is important for Jews, but it's the Messiah getting added to it. That's that's um, the goal. And so, or the telos, as Paul says in Romans 10, 4. So yeah. I think you're right. Like, if, it depends on where we start. Obviously, questions around the Jewish law are going to focus, especially on Galatians and Romans, because that's where we get so much of it. But we have to be very careful about how we extrapolate and make conclusions based on these, you know, rhetorical and very... Uh, situational letters that's good yeah yeah sometimes i sometimes when you know like i do a lot of pastoral work and i sometimes sit down with people and and end up asking the question because galatians and romans comes up so often it's like would the faith so we read it through like the you know through the anachronism of the canon now you know the new testament canon so you know, the Thessalonians, not only did Paul not write those things to them, they probably hadn't even heard them before. They probably hadn't heard the oh. emphasis like Galatian. And so would their faith have been incomplete and inadequate because they hadn't heard Paul's polemic against circumcision and against this or that? It's like, no, it's, it's just that wasn't, that wasn't at least the, the, the central focus that he was getting at. That's, that's definitely very particular. I read... I read recently, oh, I'm trying to remember who it was. I was reading, um, I was reading some, uh, a work on Second Temple, uh, Second Temple Synagogues. And uh, somebody actually made the suggestion that historically the best place you can probably place the New Testament Ecclesia, and like how it would have been seen is as, so, so basically they were saying that like in, like Acts 6, you have the synagogue of the freedmen, and that mm-hmm. the, the part of the point of the book was, or actually there was a book and an article, I don't remember which one I got this from, but was that sectarian synagogues in the diaspora were much more common than we thought they were. And he says, you know, with all the evidence, that it, it looks like that is probably the, the easiest place to place Paul's ecclesia from from uh, or ecclesiae from his from the letters would be they would be kind of like an apocalyptic sectarian synagogue. I was like, oh, that is a fascinating reading, and he kind of used a, a few you know proof texts to talk about how they would have been seen. And I was like, well, it's an interesting idea too. A lot better than church, anyways. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and a lot of scholars are are also pointing to just Greco Roman associations in general. Right. And synagogues sure. and and ecclesiae as insta- different instantiations of this. So, uh, you know, very similar to all kinds of different things that don't don't necessarily have to be religious. Um, 
but are, are sort of little groups, little communities of a sort out there. So their existence isn't weird. The fact that they think some guy that the Romans crucified has been risen from the dead and they're, you know, gathering around this uh, claim. That's what's weird. Yeah. So you brought up uh, Schweitzer, Matt. Uh, what are your thoughts on Schweitzer and kind of his continuing influence and how he's been received over the last hundred years plus? Yeah. Uh, I, I'd love to see more people read Schweitzer, uh, to be honest. Um, you know, his book on Paul is, is overall, it's superb still and holds up pretty well. And this is something that I think, you know, not enough people know is, is when you read Ed Sanders' Paul and Palestinian Judaism, which came out in 1977, uh, you know, the stuff that sticks from Sanders is actually his treatment of Judaism. His treatment of Paul isn't actually a new perspective. It's just Albert Schweitzer. Uh, which is not a uh, not trying to take away from Sanders there. I think he was trying to revivify yeah. um, Schweitzer for for uh, biblical studies, and I think he did. And right. So, his last chapter. His last chapter is just referencing Schweitzer yeah. throughout yeah. when he when he addresses Paul. It's it's yep remarkable. Yeah. So you know Schweitzer's book uh, is about the mysticism of Paul, and that's a term that has fallen into um, you know. Well, disuse people have, especially Protestants, they really move, you know, that, that gets uh, people anxious. <laughs> Mysticism just sounds, well, sounds Catholic or something. Um, right. and I, don't, no, I don't really know what the term means, to be honest. Uh, I do think concepts of participation, so that's, which is what Sanders talks about, real participation in Christ. I think that's getting closer. And Douglas Campbell, who belongs to sort of this apocalyptic uh, school of, of interpretation of Paul, which has roots in Schweitzer, but is really dominated by, by uh, Kazemon and Lou Martin um, in particular. You know, he talks about, well, I'm trying to remember, he has like a four word phrase for Paul. It's pneumatic participation um, is, is one of the words he uses. And, and it's right. I think that's exactly important for understanding Paul. And uh, this is a, a, a new movement within Judaism of spirit infused people who should have, uh, you know, unparalleled access to power to live virtuously now and will, uh, and guarantees that they will be resurrected um, later. And so I think Schweitzer's dead on on that. And uh, it's, it's good to see more and more people, I think, are picking, are, are, pushing at that again. Yeah, well, Matt, it has been great to have you. I think so many of these things that you have not only developed in your works and that other scholars are developing, are one of our goals with this podcast is to really help take these ideas that are so often discussed in the scholarly world and to make them accessible to the popular believers so that they can rightly read and understand and live in light of, uh, of the, the words of Jesus, the words of Paul, and this larger story of the covenant with the Jewish people and what it means in, for the Gentiles. And so for you to come on and, and spend some time with us this morning, we are deeply appreciative of that. And uh, listeners, we just hope that this has been provoking to you. Uh, we definitely want to challenge you and encourage you to pick up, especially Matthew's latest book, Jesus and the Forces of Death, uh, published by Baker Academic. I think it's uh, a really helpful and uh, really accessible, as I said earlier in the show, a really accessible uh, work on understanding Jesus and specifically how he deals with uh, ritual purity and impurity in a first century Jewish context. And so definitely pick that up. But Matt, again, great to have you. Thanks again for joining us. Thanks for having me. Great. Listeners, thanks again for listening to the Apocalyptic Gospel Podcast. God bless and Maranatha. Maranatha. Shalom. Thanks for listening to the Apocalyptic Gospel Podcast. For more, visit us on our website at apocalypticgospel.com and follow us on Twitter at Apocalyptic Gospel.